for, okay. Um, just some work about uh, our network. It's uh, uh, a network that involves uh, young uh, ocean uh, researchers, each uh, with different backgrounds, uh, but uh, with uh, common uh, aims, just uh, to propose solutions to meet uh, the challenges that uh, our oceans and planet will uh, face uh, in the uh, near future. Uh, one of the main goal is uh, to strengthen communication among these young researchers and connect them with uh, European policy makers, uh, political uh, leaders. Uh, and uh, among our, our activities, uh, there are uh, these webinars uh, during which uh, researchers from um, different files uh, share their, their studies uh, uh, from uh, different lines of uh, research. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us uh, today. And today we have uh, Marga Garcia from Spain. Marga, thank you for uh, being with uh, us. And uh, please, when uh, you when you want, you can start uh, your presentation. And thank you again. Okay, thank you. I'm going to share. Uh -huh. Let's see, can I share my Okay, can you see it now? Okay. Yes, perfectly. So, hello. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is uh, Marga Garcia. I am a research scientist at the Cadiz uh, Center of Oceanography. It belongs to the Spanish Institute of Oceanography and to the Spanish uh, Research Council. Uh, and I work in the Marine Geoscience Group. Uh, well, um, I have to say that uh, what I do is not related to management or to policies or anything. I'm just a geomarine scientist who happens to work in Antarctica. So when I was uh, coming back from my last cruise and saying hello to everyone after a very long expedition, I found uh, Alfredo Garcia de Vinuesa, who used to be the, the uh, young ambassador. And he asked me like, oh, that's so cool, Antarctica. So would you give a talk to these uh, people? And I said, okay, yeah. It looked like a good idea at the time. But then I, I, I checked what your interests are. And then I see that you're more interested in like uh, politics and the management and like thinking about science but I am a scientist. So I thought, okay, I can talk about Antarctica from what I think that can interest you. So I will not uh, talk a lot about my science or about research or why Antarctica is so important and so on, but uh, more uh, about uh, how uh, we do science in Antarctica. And I hope that will interest uh, some of you. Um, but I have to say that's not my topic. I'm, I'm just a geoscientist, so but I, I will try to transmit you what I know about this uh, thing. So let's see. Uh, okay, I will uh, just start with a little bit of history about Antarctic research. I will focus more on the protection of Antarctica. That I think is the most interesting thing for this uh, forum. Uh, identify some threats to Antarctica that are as threats for scientists are challenges. So are the future of where uh, science and research should uh, focus in the future. And then at the end, I will tell you a little bit about what I do, because that's what I do. Uh, and well, starting, of course, with the, 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 the start of, uh, of uh, Antarctic research in, it comes with discovery. Like uh, we, here, we see the first uh, maps uh, that were uh, painted on, on Antarctic. I cannot see the ah, there's something. Well, yeah, in in 1970, this uh, map um, uh, painted by Abraham Ortelius. Uh, as you see, it it has a huge Antarctic continent and a huge uh, Arctic. And that's because, uh, well, all the all the um, uh, sailors and uh, and explorers, uh, they saw ice and they always thought that there was a continent, uh, as it was Greenland that they, they knew and it was uh, north of Europe that they knew. 
Uh, but as time passed and more and more uh, people navigated, more explorers came, they, they, they started thinking, no, it's only ice. There's nothing behind. So we see this uh, second map from 1741 uh, that uh, it erases uh, Antarctica. They say, oh, there's nothing there. So there's just nothing. They paint nothing. Uh, but of course, uh, exploration continued, um, and they eventually, in uh, 1820, three um, explorers, three, uh, three uh, uh, seamen, uh, saw uh, actually Antarctica. They were Nathaniel Palmer uh, from the US, they were Bellings Bellingshausen, that was probably the first one, and then also Edward Bransfield. They all have their name given to ships and seas and uh, stations and everything. They, they were like the first one. I I haven't I, I like to show like real face of people, but like it, there is no real picture or photograph or anything from Bransfield. So I found this looks like the master and commander with this interrogation, and, and I like this. But yeah, we don't know how he looks. Well, in uh, 1879, uh, it started, uh, they, they established the International Polar Commission. Uh, only 12 countries uh, were part of this commission, and they were, well, mostly the US, Canada, Russia, uh, Sweden, well, all, all the countries that had an um, economic or geopolitical interest in the Arctic. So not, it was polar, but not bipolar. It was monopolar. They, they said more folks on the Arctic. Uh, they they celebrated in 1882-83 uh, the first international polar year, but they didn't do much about Antarctica. They, as I say, they focus on the on the Arctic. Uh, but uh, it was time of uh, exploration and adventure, and uh, they they kept uh, going to Antarctica, and then they focus on this uh, amazing race about reaching the South Pole. Here we know all these uh, amazing stories about. Well, Shackleton with his expedition in the endurance, they didn't make it, uh, but they survived. Um, we have uh, Amundsen and Scott who reached the South Pole uh, only with one month of difference, and with the big difference that uh, Amundsen survived and Scott uh, and his team and uh, they, they died. They didn't make it. It was a uh, very tragic, but well, uh, they liked adventure at that time. So, but they did. It. They reached the South Pole. And then exploration and science continued. So this, in the second International Polar Year, it was 32-33, uh, uh, there were already 34 nations participating. So that we see that there were more and more interest in this research. Here I found this, uh, this stamp uh, printed by in, in Russia. Uh, but we see that uh, what we see in this map in the stamp is the Arctic. So yeah, Antarctica was still not uh, in, so interesting for them. And then it came the International Geophysical Year in 1957-1958. Here I have collected uh, just from the internet uh, some uh, of the stamps and posters and, uh, and graphic material that was printed for that year. It was a big thing. It was a uh, huge, uh, not only in uh, marine, marine research or the earth uh, science, but also in uh, like space exploration. And they call it uh, the year that made Antarctica because uh, in this during this year uh, they decided that Antarctica had to be explored. Uh, there were sixty seven nations uh, that participated, and it it was very important because uh, if you think this was a time of the Cold War, and in this time uh, countries such as uh, the uh, USSR at that time and the US um, and other countries who were involved in the big world uh, wars uh, very recently, they decided to uh, to stop any territorial claim and to work together for research. Uh, this, this is very important and it's the base of uh, the treaty that is allowing to keep Antarctica for research. Uh, during this year, they established uh, scientific committees as uh, the one on oceanographic research. And the important for us is the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research, the SCAR. Um, uh, only one year after uh, the establishment of SCAR, uh, after this International Geophysical Year, 
uh, the SPAR uh, decided that Antarctica had to be protected. It's like, okay, let's go and study it. We need to study it, it's very important, but we need to protect it first. So they came out with the Antarctic Treaty. It was signed in Washington on the 1st of December of 1959, and it was signed by four countries. As you see here, we have also the countries that are have more economic or geopolitical interest in Antarctica. Of course, here we have Chile, we have Argentina, South Africa, uh, New Zealand, uh, Australia, and many other countries who were already doing uh, research there. So let's talk about the Antarctic Treaty that is still, although it, it is old, it, it, it was signed in 95, uh, uh, 1995, but it applies today. So this Antarctic Treaty is composed of 14 articles. And here I'm showing you a print of the original document. It was uh, written uh, in four languages, uh, English, uh, French, Spanish, and Russian. And it includes uh, 14 articles. It's a very short document, but really efficient. <laughs> uh, the first thing that it states is that Antarctica shall be used for peaceful purposes only. It doesn't mean that there are not military. In, uh, activity. There are uh, military people and there is military activity, but it's always devoted for support of the research or for uh, well, management of science. Uh, it also states the freedom of scientific investigation in Antarctica. So Antarctica is there for our research and nobody should tell you what you study and what you don't study. Uh, establish the cooperation, uh, international scientific cooperation. And that's important because not all the countries have the same uh, investment, the same possibilities of going there. And this is allowing many people to do their research there. Uh, also uh, about the territorial sovereign, I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce this word sovereignty. It's about uh, territorial claims. So all the countries who signed the treaty decide to stop the territorial claims. It bans uh, totally nuclear activity. It, uh, it well, the, the, the area that affects, uh, that is affected by the Antarctic Treaty is uh, limited to the south, uh, the, the area south of the 60 um, degrees south latitude, including the ice shelves. And uh, it's based, like, the, the way um, they ensure that uh, all the countries are enforcing the treaty is by inspection. So every country can have inspectors going to see what other people are doing, okay? There are other, other articles uh, about uh, jurisdiction, so which law applies to whom, uh, depending where you are. Uh, it talks about how they do their meetings, uh, some activities that are contrary to the treaty, and well, so on, more like uh, um, management of the of the treaty itself. Uh, about the international uh, scientific cooperation, uh, well, it's huge. Uh, well, anyone who goes there knows that uh, you have all the countries working there at the same time and trying to collaborate. The, this is an example. I took this uh, this um, image from the Comnab uh, meeting um, a document, and this is uh, this uh, um, scheme of on the different international uh, projects that were carried out in the Spanish uh, Antarctic stations uh, between 2014 and 2023 taking into account that the two COVID years were very limited in research. And uh, we see that there were, in these two stations, there were 50 projects from 14 countries other than, than Spain. So that gives an idea of, uh, of, of how uh, all the countries are interested in collaborating. Although many, many research that is done this way couldn't be done if any country had to do it individually. We see countries uh, from all around the world, like uh, Bulgaria is a, is a long-term uh, collaborator with the Spanish stations, but of course, Latin America, like from all the continents. So that's a very important thing, the collaboration. Here we see this uh, map, I found it on the, on the wiki, <laughs> Wikimedia. 
uh, showing, I, I'm not so sure of how updated it is, but it really shows how many stations are in, in Antarctica, mostly like uh, 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 on coastal areas. And many of them uh, are uh, concentrated in the Antarctic Peninsula because it's uh, closer to, to Latin America, to South America. So like you can get there relatively easily and the weather conditions are not too harsh. And there are so well, many, many uh, stations uh, that are based in this region. About territorial sovereignty or this word. <laughs> um, here, I, 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 I'm showing you two maps that I got. These are official maps printed by the one in the in the left is uh, by the Military Geography Institute of Chile. And the second one is by the National Geographic Institute of Argentina. It's uh, that belongs to the Ministry of the Defense. So these are really official maps. And you see that the two of them have uh, the Antarctic Peninsula as their own territory. So the claims are important. Uh, both countries are claiming that that all this territory belongs to them. But at the same time, due to the signing of the treaty, they have decided to stop that, even if they keep fighting about any other thing, but uh, uh, decide to, okay, let's forget about that. and uh, Let's do science. That's uh, what we are here for. And not only is Chile and Argentina, I'm sorry, this one is in Spanish, but also the, the United Kingdom is, is claiming the same territory. So it's, it's a serious thing. Still, everyone is cooperating and, and working peacefully uh, for research. Uh, here we see like some other countries that have like uh, claims on, on territory in Antarctica, like Australia, Norway, or New Zealand and France. Well, uh, the meeting, uh, the Antarctic Treaty uh, established an annual meeting. Uh, some years they did it every three years, but usually they do every year. Uh, they have the consultative parties that started the treaty, the non-consultative parties the, the, of different status, and they have some permanent observers that are the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research that was established, uh, who started the treaty, actually. The Commission for the Converse Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources and the Council of Managers of National Antarctic Programs that uh, well uh, organizes the research. They also have invited experts uh, such as the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition and the International Association of Antarctica Tour Operators. So that uh, speaks about how important tourism is becoming to Antarctica. Uh, the Antarctic Treaty, uh, together with other documents, forms the Antarctic Treaty system. Uh, it, it has different applications, different people signing it. But uh, it, all these three um, uh, documents are uh, the Antarctic Treaty System. The, the protocol on environmental protection of the Antarctic Treaty that I will uh, explain a little bit more uh, later on. And uh, the, con the Convention for the Conservation of Antarctic Seals and the Convention of the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources that uh, enlarges the area affected not only uh, southern of the 60 um, south uh, latitude, but uh, the area between the 60 latitude uh, south and the Antarctic convergence. Uh, this one was uh, created particularly seeing uh, how trill uh, was being affected by fishing and to um, protect uh, the trill as, as the base of the uh, food chain in, in Antarctica. Uh, well, these are the three observers. Uh, well, the star, as I said, is uh, the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research. Uh, also, the uh, COMNAP is the Council of Managers of National Antarctic Programs. It's uh, like every uh, country uh, that has uh, Antarctic programs. So one person of each program, they, they meet together and then they decide how to do it uh, together. And finally, the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, more uh, devoted to the to the protection uh, of the marine living resources. Uh, the Protocol on Environmental Protection of, to the Antarctic Treaty uh, is called the Madrid Protocol because it was signed in Madrid in, 90, in 1991. 
and it came into force in 1998. Um, the most important thing is that well, it, it makes very clear that Antarctica is a natural reserve and should be devoted to peace and science. It applies some, uh, it makes a, a state some basic principles uh, that apply to the human activities that uh, are done in, in Antarctica, not only uh, talking about science, but any kind of activity, of course. And uh, Article 7, it prohibits specifically all activities uh, relating to uh, Antarctic mineral resources uh, exploitation, except for uh, scientific purposes. Uh, there is some confusion about this. Uh, some people say that it, it was signed like the treaty and the system was signed anti for 50 years and then it will finish and everybody will be able to do whatever they want. That's not true. Uh, only during the first 50 years, it, it, is, it was very protected. It requires like a unanimous agreement of all the consultative parties to change anything. Then after 2048, uh, it, it's possible to uh, amend it and to change it, but still like most of the countries have to uh, have to, mm, to adopt uh, the, the measures that they have to decide and they have to agree. Uh, particularly the, the prohibition to exploit mineral resources is even more close. It's, it's more difficult to overcome. Uh, well, uh, and this uh, protocol, the Madrid Protocol, established the Committee for Environmental Protection, that is uh, an expert advisory body, advisory body <laughs> to provide advice and to make uh, recommendations for uh, implement this protocol. Uh, the protocol has uh, six uh, annexes. Uh, the four first of them uh, were adopted as it was signed. The fifth one uh, has been adopted uh, more recently in 2002. And the last one is signed, but has not came into force yet. It has to be like applied to the, to the law. Uh, well, it establishes uh, that uh, every activity uh, that will be done in Antarctica uh, will have to have a proper study of em environmental impact uh, assessment that will pass, uh, the, it will be approved or not. Uh, it establishes the fauna and flora that has to be protected. It talks about uh, waste disposal, uh, both in stations and on, on, during navigation, uh, also about marine pollution. Then the protected areas, they establish different types of uh, protest, protest, protected areas where, where you can do uh, different activities and they are subjected to different uh, policies. There are the Antarctic Spatially Protected Areas and the Antarctic Spatially Managed Areas, one more protected than the other. And they also establish a list of historic sites and monuments. Like, uh, well, there are many rest of uh, human activity in, in Antarctica that even if you see that sometimes and you think this is an aberration, this is part of history and it has, they decided that it has to be protected. And finally, the last uh, annex is a uh, liability arising from environmental emergencies. So if something happens, what do we do and how do we do that? Um, the, this one is not still uh, in the force. Uh, well, now I, I have identified like a little thread, some a list of threats to Antarctica. Uh, I have checked uh, what are the, what is the focus of of research in different uh, institutions and what uh, they think that are the main problems uh, facing Antarctica. That is actually what, if we think of the future, where we should look at. Uh, threats to Antarctica are actually threats to the planet because well, Antarctica uh, holds a key for um, for the future, for what will happen to climate, for, for the, the, the planetary uh, climate um, in the future. Uh, as some threats, I have identified climate change, tourism or human activity, pollution, uh, biodiversity, and the exploitation of natural resources. There may be others, but these are, these are like all, everyone agrees that these are actually they are interconnected. Like uh, they are practically the same, the same threat, but with different faces. 
And here you are seeing penguins. I've not shown any penguin yet, so of course you deserve penguins. Uh, about climate change, uh, I have um, chosen these three uh, figures. They were produced by the Laboratory on Global Climate Change of uh, NASA, and they show the the ice uh, land ice mass uh, loss between 2003 and 2023. I think it would be the the last one. This is like something like gigatons or something like like crazy numbers of uh, ice loss, and this is not modeled. This is documented. This is uh, this is real. We see how Antarctica is losing ice, and how this uh, loss of ice is uh, actually con uh, concentrated on the on the East Antarctica uh, and the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, this will have impact, as we all know, about like a global uh, sea level rise and uh, changes in the oceanographic currents and so on. Uh, so it, it comes from being a threat to Antarctica to being a threat to the entire planet, of course. Uh, tourism and uh, human activity. I, I really love this photo of, uh, this is a very old photo of tourists, uh, Russian tourists, uh, like having a bath in Inception Island. I really like it because also the, the, the ship that you see in the back of the photo is the Explorer. It sank in 2003, I'm sorry, but it, is, it's, it, it hit an, an, an iceberg and sank. So I, I really, I, I think there were no casualties, but yeah. Uh, not only tourists uh, are polluting Antarctica. Here I'm showing you the two photos with uh, oceanographic ships. The one with the penguins, it was taken by our group. This is our ship. And you see this smoke, of course. Uh, we try not to pollute, but we have to be aware that every time we go there, we are uh, making an impact. We try to minimize, but that's OK. The, the other one is, is in uh, King George Island. That's a plane of the Uruguayan for Air Force, I think. Tourist ships, ships and one uh, touristic uh, cruise ship. So yeah, there are many people going there and it has an impact. About the uh, loss of uh, biodiversity, there are many issues, there are many people studying this. Uh, you see the, the picture uh, in the lower part. Uh, these are the, the species uh, that uh, are trying to, well, that are, are being protected in Antarctica. Uh, there, there are like many plants and lichens, so many invertebrates, many vertebrates uh, all around Antarctica. They are identified. Uh, they have classified some biogeographic regions where the uh, protection uh, applies in different ways. Um, but still, uh, this map that you see in the middle with the with the uh, lines, it shows the it says a global port-to-port -port traffic network of all ships that visited Antarctica from 2014 to 2018. So uh, the ships that reach Antarctica, they have been all around the world and they bring, as they call as hitchhikers, many species that are alien to Antarctica. So that's a problem to Antarctica. Uh, we have, for instance, the, the problem of the bird flu that is uh, affecting not only uh, penguin colonies, but also other, bird, uh, uh, other birds in Antarctica. And, and it's a big thing. Antarctica used to be isolated. It's not isolated anymore. So we have to uh, take that into account. And of course, the exploitation of resources that uh, well, eventually, all the territorial claims and why everybody is there is because there are resources. Uh, here, there is a map. Uh, this was published in uh, Earth Science Reviews about all the mineral resources that have been identified in Antarctica so far. And I think as more uh, ice cover is lost, there will be more and more uh, outcrops and uh, places where uh, mineral resources could be exploited. And actually, this, uh, the authors of this uh, paper, they, they say that, well, uh, like the technology is improving, so there is less hazard for mining activities. So maybe when they revise the, the protocol, 
they could start allowing some mining activities. Like, okay, well, we'll see. Uh, and this is only mineral resources, not, talk, not talking about oil and gas. So that's, um, well, fortunately, so far, so, so good, we are protected. Also, of course, uh, like uh, fishing, fishing, uh, both legal and illegal fishing is a problem in Antarctica. Uh, not only whales, we always think of uh, like people killing whales, but uh, just krill, that is small shrimp. Uh, uh, sorry for biologists for saying small shrimp, but yeah. Uh, krill uh, is the base of the of the food chain, so the exploitation of, of krill is a big problem for all the, the rest of the biodiversity in Antarctica and uh, extended to the rest of the of the planet. Well, and finally, uh, this is the general rules that apply to to, to Antarctica uh, when it comes to research or any other activity. And then I will now explain just a little bit of what I do, just in case any of you is interested in this kind of thing. I, I started my work in Antarctica with my PhD that was in uh, Brunsville Basin, Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, and I've been there in five different uh, expeditions, uh, one in the um, Nathaniel Palmer from the US, three in the Spanish Expedites, and one um, dr drilling uh, uh, expedition in the Jade Stress Solution. Uh, my, the project I am now, I will not talk about uh, all the rest, uh, is a project and ocean. Uh, this, uh, is a, this photo is from the start of our cruise in, in Ushuaia uh, this uh, last January. And this uh, project is uh, studies the Antarctica Peninsula from the tectonic uh, and climatic point of view. Uh, to study uh, the evolution of how the tectonic evolution has affected the establishment of the current uh, ocean circulation and uh, biological productivity uh, or since the Miocene uh, to the future. So that's a long thing. In this cruise, uh, we had three sub projects and this demonstrates also how cooperation in Antarctica is needed. In this cruise, there were people um, studying since the from the opening of the tectonic plates that allow the isolation of Antarctica to the little microorganisms that are alive today and might be affecting penguins. So we try to be together to use one cruise and one ship and one time for doing a lot of things that are interconnected, but um, we could not do that uh, on, by ourselves. Uh, well, the cruise uh, we did this year, we used like many different types of uh, equipments for uh, geology, biology, oceanography, uh, well, your physics, um, as you see. Uh, what I do in my personal uh, interest is a study of uh, contourite uh, features, uh, depositional, uh, contourite, uh, depositional systems to uh, study how the intermediate and deep water circulation was in the past and how it is today. So while well, we know, we have an idea how the general uh, ocean circulation scheme is, but we go there, we take, we make like uh, some uh, seismic uh, profiles to identify some uh, sedimentary features that result from this uh, ocean circulation. So if we know where we have a mound created by the current, then we know that we have a current and we can see how this current has evolved in the past. And then we are trying to reconstruct, like here we, we find uh, how the, the seafloor is, uh, which uh, features are there and how they relate to with currents. And then we try to establish how this uh, oceanography has evolved since the opening of the basin. Just that. I'm not going deeper into that because probably it's not interesting to anyone. Just to finish, uh, things about uh, being a scientist in Antarctica that are a bit different to working in other places. Uh, what well, you need to get a training about the Antarctic Treaty and the Madrid Protocol to go there, like in Spain at least this last campaign, uh, they organized a two days meeting to explain everything to people. If you couldn't attend, you had to make a test and you had to pass the test to show that you know what you can do, what you can't do, and so on. Medical certifications are, are very, very extreme because, of course, you don't want to get sick in Antarctica. 
it's a very long trip uh, because it's far, that's it. It's far from everything. Uh, well, if you don't have spares, uh, nobody will bring them to you. And uh, like everything is very complicated. Uh, every, if, particularly if you work on, on ships as us, um, the ships are used for science and for logistics. So you waste a lot of time in logistics. Uh, of course, the high dependence on weather conditions, uh, that, uh, that's easy. Uh, about the logistics, I am showing you, this is the, the profile picture that I show. That's uh, me where we were crossing the Neptune's Velos. That is this very narrow entrance to the Deception Island. But here you see the, the map with the, these yellow lines showing the navigation. The very long straight lines are what we wanted to do for science. That's our seismic lines. And all the rest that is crazy, like going and coming and going, is just us taking people, going to the airport to get people to take to one base and then to another station and then pick up some equipment. And then it's the engine from someone. And then you have to take someone to vote because there were elections. This is crazy. From, I think it was uh, 45 days of the total expedition, we had 21 days for real work. So yeah, that's uh, that's your time and you are stuck in the ship. Uh, but well, there are very good things about being there. Amazing scenery. I've shown you some photos. Of, well, that's, what can I say? Wildlife, you see any kind of animals, it's cool. A lot of media interest that also helps in, in doing your research. It helps on getting funding. It helps on outreach. Uh, it can also be a a, a, a bad thing. Like uh, sometimes, like this, uh, when they, they were shooting this uh, documentary, and you cannot see us, but we are there in the back. They made us be there, stay, sitting for like three hours or something, and at the end, you cannot even see us. Like, but we were there. But well, sometimes, yeah, interest is good. Sometimes it's not. Uh, of course, a sense of adventure. You you you, you say the name, you say Antarctica, and it's like and people is like what. Wow. It's so cool. And um, it also gives you a I, I just put this today uh, that uh, it gives you a voice against fake news because uh, it's it's totally true. I'm telling you like true story. Yesterday, uh, I bumped into someone I know and said, oh, I was so looking forward to see you because I wanted to ask you something. I'm reading and seeing some websites about this uh, flat earth thing. So you've been to Antarctica. What's your opinion about the ice wall that they say that surrounds the air, the flat air? It's like, well, you can say, oh, I've been there. And that's not true. <laughs> and so it's like, it, it, it gives you this authority to be able to say like, uh, it, it's very important that we all say, but some people still ask you as an opinion. And it's like, no, this is not a matter of opinion. This is science, and that's what it is. But yeah, if you are there, if you have been there, you you can <laughs> claim that, yeah, that's not true. And this is a true story. It happened yesterday. And I think, uh, well, yeah, uh, as uh, early career uh, scientist, uh, I know this uh, association of polar early career scientists, APEX. It uh, it works for both for Arctic and, and Antarctica. Uh, they they have made they, they've been working for a long time. They are sponsored now by the University of, of Norway from uh, Norway's institution, but they have uh, they are partners with uh, many many organizations. Um, they provide uh, like resources for for career development for any early career scientist who is interested. Uh, they do a very good uh, work on education and outreach. They have a mentoring um, program that is working really well. And they, they provide like information about uh, jobs, um, PhD opportunities and, and so on. So I, I, I really encourage you to join if, if, if you are interested. Um, I'm giving you more penguins because uh, there were only a few. So, and these are in color, it's a very beautiful picture. And that's it. And here you have my email address in case anyone wants to uh, make any any comment or any question. And that's it. Thank you. Now, thank you, Marga.